Good morning and thank you for having me this morning. I appreciate your attendance and uh, just want to take a moment to introduce myself. I'm Dr. Paula Tharp. I am an assistant professor at Mississippi State University in the Department of Educational Leadership. So I primarily coordinate the program for um, principal preparation. And um, wanted to talk with you today about some research in, from Mississippi in our high poverty rural school districts. So just for a little bit of background, um, the research that I conducted a few years ago now um, looked at Mississippi being one of the highest poverty states in our nation and um, one of the lowest performing in education. And so to prepare for the presentation, I just looked up also information that's a little more current um, since the research was done a few years ago now, just to say that, you know, some, some data in Mississippi again on economic well-being from Kids Count Data Profile, the percent of children in poverty, um, the percent of children whose parents lack secure employment is fairly high in our state, children living in households with um, high housing cost, and then teens not in school and not working. So it just gives you a kind of a picture of the economic situation in our state. And then in terms of education, we still have about half of our students who are um, not in, <clears throat> excuse me, preschool programs. <clears throat> and then um, a very large percentage of our fourth grade students, according to the National Assessment on Educational Progress, that are not proficient at grade level in reading. And then a high percentage um, of our eighth graders who are not at grade level in math in our state. Um, so you can see that, you know, we've, we've made a lot of, a lot of progress in Mississippi. Um, there are some, some data points that are increasing, but we still have a lot of work to do in our state. And so with my background in teaching and principalship and then working in um, a school improvement company for about 15 years, my interest was how do principals in high poverty rural schools really address this situation um, and know what to do? Because we know um, from the research that if, if principals knew what to do, they'd be doing it. And, um, and it's you know, a situation in our state where it's a continuation of um, practices that are not really effective. And when you grow up in those situations and you attend those schools and you really don't have a model, what are you to do? And we know that most first year principals um, are going to go into lower performing high poverty schools. That's also um, been, been stated and found in the research. So what I did in the research study was look at <clears throat> high poverty elementary schools and I tried to, or I did, match school pairs. So I looked at a trend of performance in those schools over five years <clears throat> and um, identified schools over those five years that were improving and schools that were struggling. So they may or may not, the schools may or may not have been high performing yet, but they were on the, the trajectory for continuous improvement. Um, and then the other schools that they were matched with um, were not. They either were regressing in their um, student achievement data or they were flatlined, no improvement over time. So, um, and I matched them based on the size of school, the demographics of the school and their grade span. So I ended up looking at um, all elementary um, and then matching those sets, one improving and one struggling based on common characteristics. And um, administered the internal coherence assessment protocol survey, which was born out of the research of Richard Elmore, Michelle Foreman, Elizabeth Stosich, Stosich and Candice Bacala. Um, and what they attempted to do is create a developmental pathway for schools to move from 
low performing to improving to high performing. Um, a lot of our research and educational leadership tells schools what they should be doing, but they don't tell them how to get from where you are to where you need to be. And so um, this work around internal coherence provides that developmental pathway. So in the survey, there are um, several domains and factors that are assessed. One is to look at the, what the principal's doing. Um, how are they leading instruction? Because we've really shifted in our nation from a principal being the one who manages the school to a principal being one who really has to know um, about instruction and lead be that instructional leader. And so are they leading learning? Are they developing a climate where a faculty or a, or a group of teachers can really trust each other to have deep conversations about instruction and be willing to kind of push back on each other and learn from each other? That takes a lot of trust in a situation. And then are they really providing meaningful professional learning opportunities for teachers. So there are a few questions around that. And the, the teachers are the ones that respond to the survey. So you get their perceptions of how that's going in their building. And then we look at organizational processes. Are they really, is the structure in the organization really um, set up to provide learning opportunities for teachers. Um, there's no way that we can teach them in a teacher prep program, um, nor in a principal prep program for that matter, everything that they need to know. So we're continuously learning. Um, and do those organizational processes support teams working in shared discussion, shared learning, being very open and, um, and supportive? And are we talking about effective instructional practice? Or are we going to a professional development session on um, differentiated instruction if not everybody needs to learn about differentiated instruction? Um, and then support for teams and team processes, because we know in organizational theory that organizations improve if we have that type of work going on in our organizations. And then ultimately the goal of um, effective practices is to build collective efficacy among teacher teams. So we move beyond just individual efficacy and really make develop some interdependence among teacher teams. And so that's what the survey assessed. Um, you can find out more about that work um, in the publication by the authors of that survey. So what I found um, after teachers and principals took the internal coherence survey in their schools and I compared the results of improving schools to struggling schools is um, a statistically significant difference in the mean levels of internal coherence in those two types of schools. Um, and then the other thing that I wanted to look at is the correlation of um, student learning or student outcome measures to the results of the survey. And so in the improving schools, there was a moderately positive correlation between the levels of internal coherence and, um, and student outcome measures. And in the struggling schools, there was a moderately negative correlation between the two. That did not reach the level of significance um, in this particular study, but it, it gives you information about, you know, the power of principles working this way. And then another question I wanted to ask in the research is, is there a difference between how the principal perceives their school system and how they're working and the way that staff perceive how they're working in, a, in internal coherence? And um, so I looked at the main difference between the perceptions from the survey responses of principal and staff. In improving schools, there were no significant differences, which is interesting because if we're doing those things to learn together as an organization, then it seems to make sense that our ideas and our perceptions would come together. In the struggling schools, there was, um, it was approaching significance, although we weren't quite there, but an interesting finding and one worth 
looking into more. And then again, I asked the question about correlation. And in improving schools, there was a strong positive correlation between the perceptions of principal and staff on how they were, were going in their buildings, and then a moderately negative correlation um, in the struggling schools. So interesting findings. I also wanted to know, does it matter if we, if we really want to provide principals with a pathway to get from struggling to improving, and we, we want to do that as quickly as possible for the sake of the children that we're serving, then does it, does it matter how long you've been in that game, um, what your years of experience are in that particular school? So does it really take a long time to move a school from struggling to being on that trajectory for improvement. And what I found was um, there was no statistically significant difference based on the number of years of experience that a principal had in a school as to whether you were um, implementing the kinds of things in a building to improve or not implementing them. So that was an interesting finding. Um, so it really does suggest that this work is a great pathway for new principals taking on struggling schools to follow to improve their school. Um, and then I also wanted to look at, well, does it matter if you're an experienced principal? Can a new principal go in with this pathway and impact student learning in a pretty quick fashion. And I found no stati statistically significant differences based on your years of experience. So a veteran principal could use this process and a brand new principal could use this process. So, um, so which ties back to the survey. So what is it, again, if, if the research tells us what to do, but not how to move a school to that high performing school, then what is it that I can do as a principal who's taken on that responsibility of moving a school? And so the, the components of in, internal coherence um, would be, seems to be a, a viable pathway to move our schools. So a little bit more about what that is and what we focus on in the internal coherence work. Um, one core principle is that it's built around the work of Cohen and Ball when they talk about instructional, the instructional core. So um, the essence of the instructional core is you can't just look at our students. Um, you can't just look at teachers and you can't just look at content. So um, you've got to, it's the relationship among the three that make the difference in the classroom. How um, a teacher uses deep content and interacts with students around that content is the key. So we do a lot of work in um, what we do with schools around understanding those connections among those pieces of the instructional core. Also, this one is um, pretty powerful because we talk a lot in the educational literature about um, implementation of programs and processes and procedures. This work focuses on adult learning. So the, as the pathway to implementation, and it's a piece that we often forget as principals um, leading schools is that you can't get out ahead of your staff or your, you know, whatever, whatever organization you're a part of, you can't get out ahead of the people that are on the front line and make the work happen. So what are their needs to be able to take a deep um, new content area um, and be able to implement it effectively? So there's a learning component in there that matters. And so the visual that that goes with that in my mind is that take any improvement initiative in a building that we're focusing on. If we want to get to success in implementing that, we've got to think about the needs, the learning needs of the adults who are going to make that happen. <laughs> 